you cannot fly the Ukraine flag and not fly the Palestinian one as well. And if you have a problem with that, you need to look inside yourself and ask why it is the case. Because those situations, they're not exactly the same, but they're similar. There are peoples resisting an occupation. Ukraine, backed by the US, its resistance is good because it is a key pillar of US foreign policy. Israel is also a key pillar of US imperialism. And so its oppression as the invader, as the occupier is legitimized. You have to do some serious mental gymnastics to not see that. By all means, fly your Ukraine flag. I have no problem with it. I believe in national self-determination and liberty for all people, but all also extend that to Palestine. And if you don't, if there's something inside of you that's uncomfortable with that, you need to reflect. You need to reflect on yourself and ask why. Can I ask you to lower this flag, please? Why is that? Because the club are not politically sided either way. Yeah, but so it was okay they... when it was Ukraine, though, wasn't I it? I absolutely agree with you. That's what the argument we've had. One of the central mythologies of the Israel-Palestine conflict is this notion of a kind of parity of force. Like there are the Israelis and there are the Palestinians and they're roughly equal and they're duking out. Palestine has no army, it has no air force. Israel is a nuclear armed power with one of the most advanced militaries on the planet. The amount of military aid it receives from its main international partner, the US, is gigantic. Just in 2022, it received 3.3 billion in aid. It is completely lazy to suggest that these are just two groups of roughly equal people duking it out. It is interesting to note that even despite the fact there are collapsing and struggling economies as a cost of living crisis in this country and around the world, there always seems to be money for war. That's why tomorrow I'm going to send to Congress an urgent budget request to fund America's national security needs, to support our critical partners, including Israel and Ukraine. It's a smart investment that's going to pay dividends for American security for generations. The president defending his expected Friday request to Congress, an unprecedented estimated $105 billion in security funding for Israel and Ukraine. Billions in aid have been sent to Ukraine, billions sent to Israel. Just during the period of the war on terror, the U.S. spent over eight trillion dollars and that is while the US has massive amounts of homelessness an opioid crisis and various other social problems so you have to ask the question whether that money was well spent I can remember being in Afghanistan it was the first tour we deployed Hellfire missiles are fired from Apache a hundred thousand pounds a pop and they can only be attached to an aircraft for eight hours and so they only had a very limited amount of hours. Most of them during my tour in 2006 were never fired. And those missiles unused, 100,000 pounds a pop, were then taken home, deactivated, decommissioned and incinerated, unfired. And when I looked at that, even as a young soldier with no politics really, I started to think about the way the war machine works and the amount of money that is spent on it. And there are powerful corporate interests, arms firms, who benefit from spending massive amounts on warfare. They'll tell you it's about patriotism, democracy, or some shit about the other guy hating our freedom. But you wanna know what it's really about? What do you see? A kid from Arkansas doing his patriotic duty to defend his country? I see a helmet, fire retardant gloves, body armor, and an M16. I see $17,500, and that's what war is really about. War is an economy. Anybody who tells you otherwise is either in on it or stupid. There is an insidious relationship between politicians and arms firms and other parts of what we can broadly call the military industrial complex. The truth is it goes beyond that. It goes into things like entertainment. You'll see films which are approved, which kind of toe the line of the Department of Defense or the Ministry of Defense are given support. They're given equipment that they can put on screen. They're loaned troops for the day to run around and be extras. What undergirds that is the fact that war is profitable for a few people. I mean, it's not profitable for us, either spiritually or economically, because it takes money out of our pockets. It takes food out of the mouths of our children, it closes down our hospitals and wrecks our education system, but it's profitable for people who are in power. Some estimates suggest there have been half a million casualties in Ukraine, and we can look at that situation and other situations currently in Gaza, and look at the huge amount of people, the loss of people's lives, the injuries to people, physical and mental, which will play out for many years. And you have to ask the question, if a fraction of the money spent doing that, if a fraction of the money that ends up in the pockets of the CEOs and shareholders of arms firms went into programs of peace and reconciliation, 
would it be different? And I think probably it would. And it's always interesting to me how war is glamorized, war is kind of incentivized. War is always rendered as necessary, unavoidable, even part of human nature, which I reject. War is something manufactured. It's not something you do by reflex. It's not something you do by instinct. You don't deploy thousands of troops by accident or build aircraft carriers by accident. You trip over by accident. These are carefully thought out processes which are integrated into complex economies around the world. All that money is poured into those programs of death and destruction instead of programs of education and peace and reconciliation. We have a capacity for either thing and it's a matter of choice and political will that you choose one over the other. One of the key reasons Israel's security is so important to the US and by extension Britain, it's not out of any like deep love for Israel. This is not how great power operates. It's that Israel is a key pillar of US imperialism. We can think of it as an aircraft carrier, but on land right in the middle of the Middle East, projecting influence, protected and supported by the US, by US taxpayers' money, by US hardware. So we should not buy into these arguments. Oh, we must protect it because it's democratic. The US isn't that fond of democracy. Go through the lists of the amount of democracies that the US has overthrown in their tens. Israel is a key pillar of US power in the region. We should be absolutely clear about that. Wars are often fought under the banner of security, but that is very rarely what they provide. We have seen increases in terror attacks as a result by people citing Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, because when you unleash a war, um, you can't control what happens, you unleash massive forces and pain upon the world and those things will come back. The bomber Abedi who bombed the concert in Manchester, it turns out that his family who were part of the Libyan version of Al-Qaeda who at the time because they were opponents of Gaddafi were supported by the British and they were brought out by the British resettled in Manchester but obviously his radicalization continued which led to the deaths of those young concert goers in those horrific scenes we saw not too many years ago. And just since the recent outbreak of bombing of Gaza, we saw a Muslim child murdered, we saw a teacher stabbed by an extremist. We're already starting to see these little examples of which I suspect, sadly, there will be many more. The idea that war is something that brings security, as someone who's participated in it, and someone who's watched those outcomes as a journalist for a very long time, just doesn't cut. It just doesn't rub for me. We should be very cautious when people tell us that we're fighting to bring security. Because I think now and historically, that's not what happens. The world's a little bit more messy and complicated than that. And I think that's a bit of a, a fluffy fantasy, to be honest. With war rides authoritarianism, both overseas and at home. And this government has a particular taste for passing authoritarian legislation, which I have no doubt when Starmer takes power, he will continue to wield those laws unchanged, unrepealed. It may not be the case that you particularly agree with pro-Palestine protesters, and you may not agree with their stance, but you should understand that people should be able to air their views publicly. And if you don't do that, mark my words, it will be your thing down the line. If you're really committed to democracy in any meaningful form, you should be very conscious and supportive of people's right to protest, because this government isn't, and they will be coming for your thing next. If there is a need to change the law, just as we did in relation to Just Stop Oil protests last year, I will not hesitate to act. One of the redeeming things about people is that people are repulsed by war. That is the reason we are constantly conditioned to glorify war. That is the reason there are imperial and colonial mythologies. This is propaganda. This is not something which comes from us. It comes from the top down. Humans have the great capacity for violence, but that is not the only capacity they have. And the fact they have to be constantly conditioned and stirred towards it tells you that it's not natural. There are other options and that's about political will. It's about educating your mind. It doesn't always work. There isn't always a happy ending, but I take hope from the fact that there is an instinct in people to fight back against what is unfair. We can look at that, take some solace, and that's no better example than among the Palestinian people who suffered decades and decades of oppression by an occupying power. We could take some energy from that, I think. So that's where I look for hope these days. More than ever, and particularly in times of war, as we're seeing in Gaza and Palestine at the moment, it's important to support independent media that isn't beholden to governments and isn't beholden to the military industrial complex. Support Double Down News on Patreon today.